just a few short years ago, these large premium SUVs were very, very expensive and exclusive to the super rich only. But more recently, with the hybrid and EEV tax incentives, these cars have taken maximum advantage and they are now priced a lot lower, so now even the regular rich can afford them. So here's two of the latest models in this market. Here's the 2020 BMW X5 xDrive 45e M Sport and here we have the Volvo XC90 T8 Inscription Plus facelift. So which one of these two is better to drive, which one is more practical and most important of all, which one should you put your own money on? Let's settle all that in this video, let's get it on. Both of these models are pioneers in their own right. The original X5 back in 1999 was the very first SUV to prove that cars like these need not to be boring or sloppy to drive. It can drive just like a normal car and like a true BMW at that. And then we have the original XC90 which expanded on the idea even more fitting in 7 seats to make one of the very first luxurious MPVs around. Closer to home, both of these cars also started a PHEV or plug-in hybrid vehicle movement here in Malaysia. Even though these cars are huge and heavy, they not necessarily have to be fuel guzzlers. As usual, let's start with prices. First, the G05 BMW X5 goes for 441,000 ringgit. That is a significant hike compared to the old model. It's almost 60 to 70,000 ringgit more than before. That also makes it a full 50,000 ringgit more than the Volvo. This goes for 391,000 ringgit. Both of these cars are locally assembled CKD models. This here is made in Pekan. The Volvo is made in Shah Alam. So both models take full advantage of the SST exemptions for 2020. As for warranty, both SUVs are covered for up to 5 years, although the Volvo is limited to 120,000 kilometers, while the BMW does not have a mileage cap. Both brands offer a full 8 year and 160,000 kilometer warranty for the hybrid battery. The BMW comes as standard with a full 5 year free service package, although the Volvo can be had with a similar package through offers from the dealers. This particular car is fully decked out with the optional M performance part. So all the carbon fiber bits, the black wheels, the stickers are all add-ons to the standard price. For all the small add-ons, you'll be paying an extra 17,000 ringgit. While the fully blacked out M performance wheels are an extra 26 grand. The standard wheels are in the exact same size but in a slightly different design. If I were you, I would stay away from the options list for this car because I think it looks a little bit too obnoxious, pardon my French, but I guess yeah, you do you. The Volvo on the other hand is stock standard but you can get rather costly styling kits from around 25,000 ringgit. You can even get bigger wheels of up to 22 inches for another 25,000 ringgit. Again, if it was me, I would keep them completely stock. But on the other hand, I think it's great that these brands are offering factory options for those who want to look a little bit different. Moving on to looks, the X5 is definitely the fresher design. This being an all new model instead of a mere facelift, it looks newer and definitely more exciting than the slightly aging Volvo. Key to that is this huge center grille. It's now been conjoined and this creates one big ornament instead of two separate elements. To me, that works great. It especially fits the face of the X5 and it definitely works better here than it does on the X7 and the 7 series. This car comes standard with the full M Sport package. So it looks obviously more sporty compared to the more elegant looking Volvo. The difference is even bigger in the back where this car is full of lines, more aggressive looking with the huge exhaust frames compared to the tidier Volvo. Meanwhile, the headlamps are fully LED adaptive units which are not quite as advanced as the laser lights available on the 7 series and as options on other markets. But then again, this puts it on par with the Volvo. By the way, you'll be glad to hear that the X5's headlights have been upgraded from reflectors to projector LEDs so it will no longer dazzle other cars at night. 
The Volvo is clearly the more familiar sight, this being a facelift instead of an all new model like I said. But even then, the facelift itself is a very mild one, all it changes is just this new curvier set of grille and well, not much else really. Having said that, this is still a thoroughly handsome and good looking car in my books. It has a much simpler, cleaner lines compared to the more aggressively styled BMW. And at night especially, this carries off a much more distinctive set of lights, both front and back compared to the rather tame looking BMW. But more than anything else, I think the Volvo carries off that air of luxury more effortlessly compared to the BMW. This just looks sleek all around, while that one looks a little bit more ostentatious, a bit try-hard in my books. That counts for a lot for me. As for size, both of these SUVs measure just under 5 meters long. But between the two, it is the Volvo that is very slightly bigger on all accounts. It's slightly longer, slightly wider, slightly taller as well, with a longer wheelbase. But we're talking about small margins here. For the interiors, let's start with the BMWs first because this is a nice, fresh and modern take of a BMW SUV interior. BMW's interior game has been really, really strong lately and this is the prime example for it. I think the design looks really fresh. There's a nice touch of premium and luxury as well with all the metal looking bits. The button layout is all very nicely scattered and even the build quality is top notch. I think in this price range, this car is second to none. This is one of the few BMW Malaysia cars with the leather dashboard option and even though this is just sense attack, the cheapest faux leather option, I think it really looks good and it feels the part as well. Even if you move further down, all the plastics really hold up and there's a lot of nice leather inserts as well. All the buttons operate with a nice click and nice heft, there's a proper tactile feedback to everything and I think that's great. One aspect where the X5 is miles ahead of the XC90 is in the way it uses ambient lighting. This car just looks far more expensive, far more flamboyant when you're driving at night. And then we come to the infotainment system, which I'm sure you're sick of me saying it, iDrive is just the very best in the business. This is the latest iDrive operating system 7.0 and I think it's just fantastic. The screen is as clear and as crisp as anything in the entire industry and the control logic is just so easy to use, so intuitive. And if you're not a big fan of touchscreens, you can still use this traditional iDrive control rotary knob with all the shortcut buttons housed right around the knob. It's very easy to use. Beyond that, you've also got physical controls for your volume and all your radio controls plus a separate pod to control your climate controls. This, I think, is a far more convenient, easier to use compared to the all touchscreen system in the XC90. This system also has BMW's gesture controls like that, which I still think is an absolute gimmick. You're never going to use it properly, as well as Hey BMW control functions like that. The thing is, I still find both of these functions as pure gimmicks. There's no real practical use to them. Not when the physical controls are this easy to use. And I'm also not a big fan of the instrument cluster over here. It's just not very easy to look at. It's not extremely legible. And as far as screens go, this is not very customizable. All you can do is just change the colors according to your drive modes. But yeah, there's nothing beyond that really. The way the meters are designed is meant for you to use it with the onboard navigation system. But with no traffic information, you're unlikely to use that in Malaysia at all. So that whole function is just completely redundant really. One thing I have to mention is the wireless CarPlay function in this car. This car does come standard with it, but what you get is the trial version. Anything beyond that, you gotta pay extra over a thousand ringgit to keep on using something that's already built into your car. To me, I still don't think that's the right thing to do, but yeah, hey, once you've paid that, you do get access to wireless Apple CarPlay, which is far easier and much more convenient to use compared to a regular wired connection for Apple CarPlay. One last thing before we move on, this car comes with three different keys, the regular key, the digital key, as well as this display key. With this digital key, you can unlock the car by just tapping the card on the door handles. Or alternatively, you can use a few Samsung smartphones 
as your key as well. Now this display key is something that's a little bit more unique. It is a huge key with a screen built in that you can just control a few certain things. But having said that, this is a much bigger hassle than it is good. I mean, it's so big, it creates a big bulge in your pocket, which is not really a good thing. And the screen itself looks like something off your handphone from 10 years ago is just so pixelated and even the response time is kind of slow. Yeah, it's just not modern at all. Now onto the XC90, I think the interior is starting to look a little bit plain, especially next to the newer, more glitz and glamour BMW X5. This has gone largely unchanged for the past five years and it's starting to look its age. I think the XC90's exterior has certainly aged a lot more gracefully than the interior. Having said that, the build quality is generally still very, very good. The whole top half is covered in nice and plush leather. And even down here, the plastic quality is still pretty good. It's just that there's a bit too much piano black inserts over here and down there looks a little bit cheap. And there are some usage of cheaper plastic panels. I think this has no place in a premium car. But I still think the Volvo has a more practical cabin compared to the BMW. There's a lot more usable cubby spaces inside this cabin. And even though the BMW has a much larger door bins on the sides, I think this is where you need more space. And a much bigger advantage for the Volvo is in the use of really plush and soft Nepa leather upholstery compared to the rougher Vanesca leather used on the BMW. This really lifts up the feel and mood of this cabin to look and feel a lot more expensive than the BMW. Even the seats themselves are a lot more comfortable in the Volvo compared to the X5. This here offers a lot more support and adjustments compared to the one on the BMW and I think for long trips, this is the one I would rather be in. New for the facelift model is this gorgeous crystal gear lever. This is still supplied by Aurifors and it's now lit from the bottom. It looks absolutely marvellous from all angles. What has not been changed is the centre screen which is still a full touchscreen unit and it controls everything right down to your aircon controls which I've said this many times is a little bit distracting when you drive on the highway. It also has a regular wired CarPlay instead of wireless in the BMW but at least you don't have to pay extra for it, it just works. Another thing that I find to be in the favour of Volvo is the use of this really nice linear wood trim as compared to the nasty glossy wood in the BMW. While this looks and feels really expensive, the one in the BMW looks like something you'd find in a really old 15 year old Toyota Camry. But for whatever reason, Volvo Car Malaysia still insists on putting manual steering adjustments on all its models instead of a much nicer electric adjustment system. This, I would say again, has no place on a premium car, let alone a flagship top of the line model. But the saving grace for the Volvo interior is, of course, the absolutely marvellous Bowers & Wilkins audio system. This pushes out 1,400 watts of output compared to just 464 in the BMW's Harman Kardon system. But beyond just plain numbers, this sounds glorious. The Harman Kardon system in the BMW is not too bad. It's one of the better sounding systems in this price range. But this just sounds so much clearer and it offers you so many little adjustments that you can make to get that specific sound that you want. It's just out of this world, really. With cars as big as this, you would expect a very spacious rear quarters and you won't be wrong. This is my own sitting position. As you can see, there's a whole load of legroom left. Headroom is also not an issue for anybody even with this full length sunroof and play. As for the seat itself, it's fairly comfortable if rather on the flat side of things. Although you can't really adjust the rear seat angle which is a bit of a shame for a family oriented SUV. One advantage over the Volvo is the less intrusive center tunnel and the center seat itself is also more comfortable than the one in the Volvo. So if you're planning to go five on board this car, this is the slightly better option. Both cars come with a full four zone climate control system. So you get a full set of aircon controls in the back here. But what this car adds over the Volvo is a Blu-ray player to play high definition videos on these individual screens. 
Both of these displays are also touchscreen units with a similar interface to what you find in front. And you can even cast videos from your handphone to play on the screen, even though this uses a mirror cast function which only works on Android phones. If you have an Apple phone, yeah, too bad. As for build quality, again, it's pretty good in the back here. The door cuts are all lined in nice leather, even though the plastic housing of the rear aircon vent is absolutely nasty. It's hard and scratchy. Yeah, it just looks completely out of place in an overall really good cabin. The Volvo does not have any fancy rear screen whatsoever, but what it does have is a much bigger, much more spacious rear quarters. As you can see over here, that is my own driving position. I've got at least a couple of inches more legroom compared to the BMW. Headroom, again, is never going to be an issue for anybody, and the sunroof is as big as in the BMW. The seats are almost as good as the ones in front. It's very comfortable, very supportive, and at least you get to adjust the rear recline angle to your own preference which is not available in the BMW. A few other things also make this car the far more practical choice. Number one, the B-pillar vents are placed a lot higher so it's closer to your face whereas the one in the BMW is placed a little bit lower so yeah you won't really feel the aircon as much. The step up into the cabin is also a lot lower compared to the BMW so for younger kids and older folks this again is a much easier car to get in and out of. One major blip for the Volvo is the lack of any USB charging ports for your rear passengers. And this big center tunnel is very big, a lot bigger than the one in the BMW. The center seat itself is also not very comfortable because the backrest is way too hard for longer journeys. It's best used with this feature. The integrated booster seat for younger kids. This, after all these years, is still a genius addition. The Volvo also adds on these manual sun blinds for rear passengers and the whole headline is finished in white or blonde which to me fits a family-oriented SUV much more than the full black interior of the BMW. As you know, the Volvo comes with a pair of extra seats in the back making it a proper seven-seater. Now this is made possible because Volvo has designed the XC90 with its battery pack running across the center of its spine, whereas in the BMW, the battery pack is placed underneath the boot floor. So of course, there's no more room left to fit a set of folding seats. The seats themselves are very surprisingly quite comfortable in the back here. It's quite soft, there's a fair bit of cushion, and in true Volvo fashion, there's a full headrest as well. Passengers in the last row also get their own dedicated aircon vents in the back here, which is great, even though there is a small complaint with the use of very hard plastics in the back here. This cubby bin cover especially closes with a really cheap knock. But then again, these two seats are only ever going to be used occasionally, so I guess that's not too bad. And legroom itself, it's not too bad as you can see. And in this configuration, I can fit myself in each one of these three rows. I myself think I can fit in the back here for one or two hours before I start complaining. And that is more than what I can say with pretty much all other seven-seater SUVs in the market today. Now the boot is obviously going to be just as important as these are supposed to be very practical SUVs. And straight ahead, this car, the BMW X5, gets a head start for having a split tailgate. Now this is something that's rare in the market, but I think it is a fantastic offer. It gives quite a few advantages from having a regular tailgate like in the Volvo. Number one, you can more easily carry up your luggage into the boot without having to worry about damaging your bumper over here. And of course, you can open up the boot even if you're parked really up close against a wall because it takes up a little less space to open, obviously. And the last one, my favorite, you can do this, which is called tailgating. Now, this is the tailgating that you should do in a BMW, not the other annoying kind. The boot itself is very spacious at 500 litres, even though it's a little bit smaller than the non-hybrid X5 due to the battery placement. But at least you still get a small hidden compartment underneath the floor. One advantage over the Volvo is the fact that you can fold the rear seats down by pulling these handles over here. While in that car, you have to go around the side doors to do it, which is a lot less practical. 
Now, the Volvo obviously having a traditional tailgate is not quite as fancy as the BMWs, but the boot itself is so much bigger, it's so much more practical. In full seven-seater mode, of course, it's not going to be as big a boot space as the BMW, but there is still more than enough space for a weekend getaway, I think. It's 260 liters here. But for more serious bullet kampung trips, you can always fold down the rear seats as easily as that. And that opens up a massive 640 liters of boot space. That's a fair bit bigger than the BMW. And when you fold all the seats down, you get up to 1,800 liters of space in the Volvo compared to 1,700 in the BMW. Having a bigger car in this regard definitely pays off. One nifty feature in the Volvo's boot is a vertical flap with extra hooks to stop your small items from rolling around the entire boot floor. Both SUVs can also lower their load lips by using the rear air suspension system, but the Volvo lowers it a little bit more compared to the BMW. Before we drive these SUVs, there's just one thing I want to touch on. Even to this day, a lot of people are still actively avoiding or even outright dismissing the Volvo brand because its cars have low resale value. The thing is, that's not even true. Using these two cars as an example, the market value for a four-year-old plug-in hybrid BMW X5 is around 180, 190,000 ringgit right now. Whereas a Volvo XC90 of the same age today is still worth over 200,000 ringgit. It's just normal for premium brands to suffer heavy depreciation over the first couple of years. If you are still complaining about it, I guess you can't afford one. So we're finally on the road. Let's talk about the biggest change for the X5 XDrive 45e, a brand new engine out front. So out went the old 2.0-litre turbocharged engine and in comes a 3.0-litre inline-six turbocharged engine. That itself sounds like a huge upgrade, but let's talk about the numbers. The engine itself makes 286 horsepower and 450 newton meters of torque. On top of that is a new electric motor, now making 113 horsepower and 265 newton meters of torque. The combined figure BMW claims to be 394 horsepower and 600 newton meters of torque. That's a massive upgrade over the old car, which had a combined output of 313 horsepower and 450 newton meters of torque. But as good as that sounds, that still pales in comparison against the Volvo XC90 T8 because that car has a twin charge 2 litre engine that is both supercharged and turbocharged. So the engine itself makes 320 horsepower and 400 newton meters of torque. And then there's an electric motor adding on additional 87 horsepower and 240 newton meters of torque. The combined figure for the Volvo is 407 horsepower and 640 newton meters of torque. That's more than what the BMW offers despite the bigger engine. Now, some of you may be wondering, why is it that Volvo can simply combine both the outputs of the engine and electric motor, while BMW has a slightly different formula to it? You can't just simply combine them. Now, that is to do with the very distinct and different ways of implementing the plug-in hybrid system. Well, BMW has the electric motor sort of sandwiched between the engine and the transmission. The power outputs of both systems go through a single output shaft. So there will be some overlap between the engine and the electric motor. So what BMW claims as the combined output is the sort of like effective engine power overall. The Volvo on the other hand is very different. The engine only powers the front wheels, while the electric motor only powers the rear wheels. There are zero overlap. Whatever power that the engine or electric motor makes is transferred straight down to the floor. So Volvo can just combine the two numbers. So yeah, if you've been wondering about that, that's your answer. Surprisingly though, despite these cars having two completely different ways of implementing PHEVs, the 0 to 100 claim figures are exactly the same. 5.6 seconds. Well, out on the road, I've managed to time the BMW X5 to be around 5.7, 5.8 seconds, while the best I could do with the Volvo was around 6.1 seconds. 
but even then both are extremely fast for such a big and heavy SUV. It's almost amazing really, you wouldn't expect such big cars to have that much power. The power delivery between these two cars are also quite different. The BMW I think has a bit more low-end torque, that surely comes from the bigger engine. And even at the top end, this feels like it has more to give, it doesn't run out of puff fairly early on like in the Volvo. But that's only when you're being a little bit extreme with it, out on the normal roads, being driven like a normal everyday drive. Both engines are extremely quiet, both engines are extremely smooth and the electric motors, you do not feel any bit of it coming on and off or the engine turning on and off. They are completely seamless. The Volvo especially has come a long way since the pre-facelift XC90. Over that one, the transitions can be a little bit crude, can be a little bit rough, but now that has all been fixed, it's super smooth now, up to the level of the BMW. But of course, when the engine eventually comes in, you will hear a little bit of the engine on both cars. The difference is the engine sound of the BMW is nice and sweet from the six cylinder, while the engine sound of the four cylinder in the Volvo can be a little bit gruff. I mean, four cylinder engines have come a long, long way in terms of developing more and more power. But what it cannot do is replicate the silky smooth, buttery feel of a proper six cylinder engine and that is the biggest advantage of the x5 in my books but of course there is a price to pay for that quite literally actually with the malaysian road tax system being the way it is you would be paying around 1600 ringgit per year for the bmw's three liter while the xc90's two liter engine will only cost you around 400 ringgit a year but thankfully the way it works with suvs you pay the exact same amount whether it's a private registration or a company registration if it was a sedan, you'd be paying around 6,000 ringgit for a 3 litre engine and just about under 600 for a 2 litre engine. There's a big difference there, a much bigger difference compared to an SUV here. You'll be paying a little bit more in terms of fuel too. With the Volvo XC90, I managed to get an average of around 9 litres per 100 kilometres over everyday drives with a bit of city traffic included while in the BMW I would struggle to dip below 10 litres per 100 I actually ended up with an average of around 11.5 litres per 100 kilometres that is a fair bit more compared to the Volvo but then again considering the much bigger engine that's a fair difference I would say but let's not take anything away from the powertrain of this BMW. That engine is an absolute star. Because of the way it sounds, because of the way it feels, you will want to rev it and rev it hard. And that will eventually end up making you use more fuel anyway. And of course, the transmission plays a big part as well. The BMW runs the traditional ZF 8-speed transmission. I've always said this, I'm going to say it again, it's the very best in the business. While the Volvo runs an Isin 8-speed transmission, which is known to be a little bit slow. Of course, with this being a PHEV, you don't really feel the lapses, you don't really feel like it's a bit slow in terms of its gear changes but the response time when you call upon quick acceleration there is a stark difference there with the bmw it's almost like it's directly connected to your foot as soon as it goes down the car just jumps forward no hesitancy no pauses whatsoever in the volvo there's always going to be like half a second or even one second gap between you putting your foot down and the car moving forward once it does it does go in a rapid way but yeah, there is still going to be that small gap, which is not here in the BMW. <laughs> it just goes, it's a magic, it's amazing. Now let's talk about the PHEV battery, which of course is a big part of these cars. The X5 has a much larger battery pack compared to before. Before this, it only had a 9 kilowatt hour battery, but this has a 24 kilowatt hour battery. That is almost a three times more than before. The Volvo XC90 also has a slightly bigger capacity battery than before, but it's only up from about 9 to 11.6 kilowatt hour, a small jump. But because of the huge battery pack, that also makes the BMW a little bit heavy. It's almost common knowledge nowadays that Volvo PHEVs will be a fair bit heavier than its BMW or Mercedes counterparts, but not this X5. This is two and a half tons. The Volvo is around 2.3 tons. You don't really feel it when you drive it, but 
on the scales, that's what it shows. The BMW X5 has a claimed oil electric range of around 77 kilometers. That is a huge upgrade over the old car's 31 kilometer range. But again, in the real world, you'll be lucky to get anything above 50 kilometers of all EV range. But that itself is a lot bigger, a lot more than what you get in the XC90. That has a claimed EV range of 51 kilometers. But I got around what 38, 39 kilometers max and nothing more than that. So in terms of electric range, the BMW still has the advantage. But it does it by having a much bigger, much heavier battery pack. And that you have to charge every single day. If you don't charge your Peach EV every day, you're just not using the full benefits of it. Not only that, you're still carrying dead weight every single day. You are just wasting more and more fuel. That completely defeats the purpose of buying an eco-friendly hybrid car in the first place. And because the battery pack in the BMW is just so big, it just takes so much longer to charge it. With the standard 3-pin plug home charger, you'll need about 11 hours to charge the battery from zero to full. Nobody has that much time at night. So of course, it is recommended to buy the optional BMW wall charger that has a slightly higher capacity charger that will take you around seven to eight hours depending on what settings you put it at. The Volvo does not have the same issue because of course the battery capacity is a lot smaller. It's only 11.6 kilowatt versus 24 kilowatts. So even if you use the standard slow charger, it'll only take about four to five hours. If you use the bigger charger, it will take you around three hours. That's as good as it gets, really. The X5 is perhaps the very first PHEV to have this slow charging issue. All PHEVs on the road have a slow charging capacity of around 3.7 kilowatt hour charging rate. But that has been fine for all these small battery packs. This has a 24 kilowatt hour battery pack that is bigger than a few small EV city cars. It would have been great if BMW put in a bigger charger. If we can charge at around 7 kilowatt hour, you can fully charge it in between 2, 3, 4 hours. That would be a lot more ideal. But then again, if you don't charge your truck every day, that's a moot point anyway. Now let's talk about handling for a while. I know these are SUVs, so handling will not be a big aspect when it comes to what you find, what you expect from a drive perspective, but then again, this is also a BMW, so you want it to drive like a true BMW, right? And in all aspects and purposes, this car absolutely does. There's a sense of fluidity in the way the steering wheel feels in your hand and the way the axles turn, the way you pivot around in each corner. It feels like a true blue BMW, there's no denying that. And this is a big advantage over the Volvo XC90. It's not to say that the XC90 is boring, completely rubbish to drive. It's just not as exciting as this one. This moves the benchmark for fun large SUVs by quite a far margin that the XC90 just feels a little bit hollow in comparison. The XC90, if you put it into sport mode, it can be quite a handful as well. It can take corners at a really fast rate, but because you're really high up, you're carrying a lot of mass, you will feel the front sliding a little bit. Your passengers will complain that you are moving them a little bit too much in the car. While in the BMW, you just feel a lot more lower to the ground. You feel a lot more planted as well. You don't feel like you are on the edge of grip as early on as what you have in the Volvo. But as with everything, there's the good and then there's the bad. To talk about comfort, let's move on to the XC90. Now, in the Volvo XC90, the very first thing you will notice is just how comfortable this car is. Now, that is not to say that the BMW is uncomfortable because it's not. In fact, if you were to drive that car by itself, you'll probably feel it's pretty damn good. It's pretty soft for a BMW. It's only when you drive these cars back to back that you feel the stark differences between these two. The Volvo is just on a different level when it comes to comfort. It just flattens out all the smaller bumps and floats about on the highways to a different degree than what the BMW is capable of. The BMW already has a big upgrade over the previous generation X5. The previous X5 only had air suspension on the rear axle, while this latest version has air suspension on both axles, matching the XC90 over here. 
but perhaps BMW is sort of reacting to complaints it's had on the previous generation X5 where people found it a little bit too floaty, a bit too bouncy. So they sort of firmed everything up for this X5, a bit more like a proper BMW, I would say. I wouldn't say it's a bad thing per se, but in terms of comfort, comparatively between these two, this is on a whole different level. On the highways, the difference is actually very, very big. With the Volvo, you almost feel like you're floating across the highway, while the BMW, you feel a lot more planted. You feel like you're more part of the road, more of the driving experience, perhaps that was engineered in. But in terms of pure comfort, the Volvo is what I prefer more. But when it comes to very sharp and small bumps, it's the Volvo that is better. Again, that is more to do with the tyre choices, I think, because the BMW runs full run flat tyres, while the Volvo runs traditional tyres. Both of these cars run the same 20 inch wheels, so the difference is all in the tyre choice. But beyond comfort, there are other benefits to choosing the Volvo over the BMW too. Number one, I would say that this is the easier car to drive because visibility is just better in this car. With this one over here, you can see that the wing mirror is placed slightly further back, creating a small gap between the pillar and the wing mirror. So you can see through it, sort of eliminating a few blind spots for the driver. With this, you feel a little bit more confident in placing the car, especially if you're going through very tight city roads or even parking lots. Speaking of parking, these cars are massive and with Malaysian parking lots being so small, you'll be left with very little space on all sides when you've already parked this car. And while parking, it's actually easier to park the BMW because it has such a much better parking cameras. With the Volvo, you get a choice between showing the 360 degree camera or the reverse camera, whereas the BMW can show you both at the same time. When you're parking, I think it's very beneficial to have the views of both the 360 degree camera and the reverse camera at the same time. So I just don't understand why Volvo refuses to show both at the same time. Now, BMW Malaysia will also tell you that there is a brand new feature on the X5 called Reversing Assistant and that will make it easier for you to park your car. But I'm sorry to say that is absolute nonsense because most Malaysian drivers will use reverse parking rather than forward parking. So Reversing Assistant is completely redundant, pretty much a gimmick again in Malaysia. What is not a gimmick though in terms of driving assist is the Volvo's Pilot Assist system. This is a semi-autonomous driving feature that controls both the pedals, the brakes, the throttle pedal, as well as the steering wheel. This is a step up from the adaptive cruise control that you get in older cars. Now, Volvo has fitted this system on the XC90 for quite a while now. I remember trying it back in 2016, I think, where I found it to be a bit crude, a bit rough where it only worked in ideal conditions. Only when the road lines are perfectly clear, it would catch on. But with typical Malaysian roads where, you know, the lines just go off at certain points, it just did not work properly. But now I'm happy to report that they've completely revamped the whole system. So now it works almost perfectly even with our typical Malaysian roads. I was driving this car on the Karat Highway through all the twists and turns with the system on and it tracked completely throughout the whole drive. It did not release contact for about two hours on end. It's absolutely amazing, I think. It has completely improved from being one of the worst systems out there, always tugging at your steering wheel, always jabbing your throttle, jabbing your brakes, to being one of the smoothest, the best, out there in the business, it is an absolutely amazing improvement. It has come to a point where I'm willing to put full faith in the system to drive on the highways and it makes me believe that fully autonomous driving is actually achievable in the near future. Now the BMW X5 does not have this feature at all. Its advanced driving assist functions only end at AEB and yeah cross traffic alert and blind spot monitor and things like that, you do not get this fantastic feature. You may not think that this is a crucial feature to have, but once you have experienced it, a system that is this good, you will not want to drive a car without it, let alone a more expensive car without it.
Speaking of improvements, another big jump that Volvo has made is in the way this car brakes. I've said this many times, the older Volvo PHEV cars had terrible braking system. It was so inconsistent, it was so unnatural that to most people it became a deal breaker. But I'm glad to say that the latest XC90 has completely fixed this issue. The braking pedal now feels completely natural. It has a brand new brake by wire braking system. It now feels like a non PHEV car to slow down. There is no inconsistency. It feels completely natural like a bog standard car and that is a good thing. But having said all that, the BMW still has the edge in terms of braking power compared to this Volvo XC90. It just stops in a much more confident manner compared to the Volvo. That car has a slightly bigger brake disc, a bigger, more powerful braking calipers compared to the Volvo where this car can feel a little bit under braked, which is not something that is common to feel on modern cars anymore. I'm not saying that this car does not have strong enough brakes, but there will be times where you think that you could use with a bit more braking power, but not the BMW. That car, despite it being a heavier car, 200 kilograms heavier than the Volvo, it stops on a dime. It's amazing. And lastly, let's talk about refinement. This is extra crucial for these two cars because these two cars can cruise up to around 120, 130 kilometers per hour with the engine turned off. So you'll be hearing everything that the car is throwing at you, road noise, wind noise, everything. With the Volvo, it's almost a properly silent experience except for a little bit of wind noise coming in above 110 and a bit of road noise coming anything above 80 kilometers per hour. The BMW X5 is slightly better in this regard, perhaps because it is the slightly newer car. It is almost completely silent at anything up to 120 kilometers per hour. That is quite something. So to summarize the whole driving experience, I would say that the X5 has an advantage in terms of its engine, its transmission, and of course, handling. And with its much bigger EV range, you will enjoy more guilt-free, all-electric drives more than in the Volvo. The Volvo, on the other hand, counters with a much more comfort, more family-oriented chassis settings with the addition of the fantastic pilot assist system, which actually works like a charm. So in short, I would say that for quick, short drives alone, the BMW X5 will be the better car. But for longer drives, longer trips with the whole family, the XC90 will serve you a lot better. It's as simple as that. So that's our comparison review of the BMW X5 and the Volvo XC90. In short, both of these cars are fantastic buys for being this fast, this practical, and they both offer really good value for money, especially with our tax breaks. But of course, the Volvo has a big head start with this being more affordable, with a lot more equipment at the same time. Having said that, the BMW does put up a huge challenge. It has a sweet six-cylinder engine and its all-electric range is more than the Volvo. It also has a fantastic interior and that BMW driving dynamics shines even for cars as big as this. Having said that, the Volvo proves to be just as fast and not that far behind in terms of dynamics. It's also far more comfortable and practical for the family compared to the BMW. So choosing between these two cars is quite simple actually. If you're buying the car more for yourself, for you to enjoy driving day in and day out, it has to be the BMW. This is the much more accomplished, more dynamic choice. But if you just want the most practical, most comfortable car for your whole family, then you can't go wrong with the Volvo. This will fit your requirements much better than the BMW. Me personally, while I do adore the driving dynamics of the BMW, if I were in a position to buy a big and comfy family SUV in my life, I think I would side with the Volvo more. It's plusher, right? Scores big points for me, and the full semi-autonomous driving feature is not something I would want to miss, especially at this price range. So over to you, which one of these cars would you prefer and why? Let me know in the comments section below. Thank you for watching and stay safe everyone.